In our last session, um, there were a couple of things that I forgot to mention. I think I was having one of those senior moments when I brought back up Colossians 1.15 and I didn't complete my thought. Okay, so when we are in Genesis 126 and we looked at the word we looked at the word image and we found that it was the Elohim that said let us make man in our own vain show let us make man in our own um, you know there were several other words to describe what that meant it was you know let us make man in our own illusion let us make a phantom this is what that word image means. But when we go back to the original scripture that we had read, uh, we had applied it to other applications. But that scripture is, um, it is Colossians 1, 14 through 17. And we're going to look at verse 15. It says, it's talking about Jesus Christ as we discussed before. It says, who is the image of the invisible God? So, if anybody is in God's image, it is Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus Christ is the express image of the invisible God. He is the Son. He is part of the Godhead. All three are one. Okay. Now, the point that I was making to this is when you look at the word image in Colossians 1, 14 through 17, it has a whole different meaning than what it does in Genesis 1, 26. So, with that, if you want to look at your Strong's Concordance and look up number G for Greek, 154. Zero 04. It's in the second half of your strongs. Or if you're on E sword, it's right there. Just wave your wand, little um, cursor thing over it. All right. What does that word image mean? It means a likeness that is literally a uh, literally statue profile or figuratively a representation, a resemblance. Okay, that is Jesus Christ. He is in the likeness. He is the image of the invisible God. Doesn't say anything about a vain show. Doesn't say any of that. Yet, when you go into Genesis 126, that word image is the one that um, means phantom, an idol, a vain show, an illusion, okay? So there is a difference, and it's the same word. just has two totally different meanings in your Bible. There was one other thing also that I wanted to bring up. And when I first started the two types of creation, one of the things I said is that the two only had one similarity that I could see. And it didn't even have anything to do with what it was talking about. That similarity is that nowhere in either of those two accounts of creation is God creating the angels. Okay? He's not creating the angels in, okay, in Genesis 1, the Elohim. They're not being created in there anywhere. And in Genesis 2. I don't see where God is creating the Elohim. But we do know from Scripture that Elohim are created beings. They're the gods with the small g, created beings. Okay? Uh, they were never from the beginning with the Godhead. They were created. As we're going to see as we go into our next few verses on somebody else. But, um... They, nowhere in the Bible does it tell us when exactly the angels were created. But if they weren't in Genesis 1, and in fact they were doing some of the creating themselves, and in Genesis 2 there's no account of them being created, 
And we know that in Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2, there was a large span of time where there was a form of man on this earth um, that got wiped out under destruction. Well, the angels were around. They were created. It had to be created sometime in between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, um, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1. Okay, because we don't see them being created in the chapter of Genesis 1. We don't see them being created in the chapter of Genesis 2. So those are just two points that I wanted to make that I had forgotten to make in the last video. The other one is I've just decided to go right into the angel wars, you know. Um, but before we get there, I want to read a couple of scriptures on Lucifer. You know, Lucifer was the anointed cherub. Um, Lucifer was good until iniquity was found in him, and he became Satan. Okay? There are those that will argue and tell me Satan and Lucifer are not the same. Um, in one aspect, they're right. They're not the same. You know, when Lucifer was uh, under God in the heavens, doing what Lucifer was supposed to be doing, Lucifer was not Satan. But after the fall, he became Satan. Okay? Let's see who Lucifer was. Because there was some pretty... There's a couple of little things that are in the Bible that give us a clue as to some aspect of him and what he did in the heavens. Okay? And the first verse that I would like to read... Hmm, you know what I did? I have it right here, so... Give me a moment. Here we go. Nope, not that. You know, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of information to have in front of me and um, try to uh, find. I, I've got like a notepad here, but I, I got to flip around and find what I'm talking about. Okay, the first verse that I want to uh, go to is Ezekiel 28, 1 through 19. Okay. And it says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God. That though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Okay, so right now we are talking about the Prince of Tyrus. Okay, um, who is the Prince of this Prince of Tyrus? Well, Ty, the Prince of Tyrus is mentioned a couple times in scriptures. However, they are not attributed to the same person. In this instance, we are talking about Lucifer. Um, you know and He's puffed up, man. He's thinking he should be in the seat of God. We're going to continue to verse 3. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches, and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thine riches. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom. He's smart. Man, this entity is smart. And they shall defile thy brightness. Did you know Lucifer means um, um, sh uh, shining one? Okay. Did you know that? That the um, Illuminists, they worship Lucifer, okay? He was a morning star, and um, according to the Bible. So anyway, 
Anyway, it says, And they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Now right here I want to bring your attention. We're going to get into this in a whole other chapter coming up. In the midst of the seas. You see that word seas? That's allegory. It's talking about the sea of humanity. It's not talking about the ocean. So, okay. Verse 9. Wilt thou yet say before them that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Lord God, like in Genesis 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Cyrus. Now, huh, we're getting to it. Now he's king of Cyrus. Tyrus, I'm sorry, I keep seeing Cyrus. And they say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He was gorgeous. He was smart. He was gorgeous. And, um, you know, he, he was. He was a beautiful anointed cherub. He was very beautiful. You know, Satan doesn't come to you with a pitchfork and horns. He's beautiful. He looks good. Thou hast been in the garden. <laughs> Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, topaz, and the diamond. The beryl, the onyx, and the jasper. The sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee the day thou wast created and i mentioned something right here satan's a created being so if you're locked into some kind of religion that is teaching you that satan and jesus are space brothers that's a lie right here now you already know, you already know from Colossians, right? You already know from John, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. You know that Jesus Christ was from the beginning the Godhead. Lucifer's a created being. He's not anywhere on the same level as Jesus Christ. Not in power, not in anything. Okay, he's been given a season, and that's about it. Okay, he is not on the same level. He wasn't even on the same level when he was an anointed cherub. Jesus Christ still had all things, all things were subject to him, including Lucifer, which is probably has something to do with the war that began. Okay. Number verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. That is a high position. If you're the if you are the anointed cherub cherub and that covereth, that's an important place. And a cherub, for the record, isn't one of them fat little babies with wings that you see when you go and you look at these pictures at Hallmark and wherever okay get that picture out of your head that is not what a cherub looks like okay and I have set thee so thou wast upon the holy mountain of God thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Here we are again. We're reiterating. Lucifer was a created being. He was created in perfection by the Lord God. He was beautiful. He had he was he had instruments in him. He led the worship. Okay? 
He was a covering anointed cherub. He led the worship, but he was created. He wasn't from eternity. He was created being. Okay. Until iniquity was found in thee. Okay. When the iniquity was found in him, that was the downfall. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. He thought he was all that. He really did. Narcissist. Narcissist. I mean, come on. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Okay? I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities. By the iniquity of thy traffic, therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be anymore okay this is what the Lord God is saying about Lucifer okay that's pretty interesting okay he had he was full of himself I mean he just got to the point where wow he just thought he could be God and I do want to say something I'm going to mention this and this is um, just just an understanding that I have had and I have learned over the years is that the Lord when he gives somebody an anointing it's a powerful thing it is a very powerful thing and a lot of times in that anointing you feel like you know everything it's crazy because there is a, a oh a tiny part of God that is flowing through you and you just feel like you know a lot and you know it ain't you you know it's the Lord that is giving you this wisdom but there have been many people that have carried an anointing that have fallen because it's we're in the flesh human beings are in the flesh and we're going to get into that also and explaining what the flesh really is. But I'm, I'm telling you that when you're carrying an anointing from the living God, I mean, you are, you are flowing with the presence of God in you. You know, it's a very powerful thing. But the flesh, the enemy can attack you. And many men that have carried anointings have fallen. They have fallen because of pride. They have fallen because of lust or other sins. Okay. Um, yes, it's an attack of the enemy on them. But yes, people that have had strong anointings have fallen. It is easy in the flesh to just become full of ourselves and think that we know everything. Especially under an anointing. So, an anointing is not something you take lightly. An anointing is something you cherish, but you always got to keep yourself in check. Because if you don't, you could end up um, falling and falling hard. Okay. Um, one example. I mean, there is, there's one example is Solomon. You know, he, um, he fell into the mystery Babylonian religion. He uh, started getting into mysticism. Uh, another one, Saul. Saul carried an anointing and he was going to kill David. And if you read the story of King Saul, it was taken from him. Uh, even David had made a statement, you know, that far be it from him to touch God's anointed, even if he's in sin. 
And, you know, and as we see, Saul fell. And I don't remember reading anything of any repentance about Saul either. I just know that as a last resort, Saul decided to use witchcraft as a means of trying to hear something because he knew he knew his anointing was gone okay anyway getting back to Lucifer I have another chapter here that we're going to read about him for those of you that don't understand who Lucifer was we're going to go to Isaiah 14 12 through 19 okay and then this verse they're calling him by name Okay, it's actually, they're not giving him the title, Prince of Tyrus, King of Tyrus. This here is calling him out by name. Verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Okay, what nations did he weaken? Because if this is referring to him as Lucifer, he's Satan in our world. He was Satan from the day of the Garden of Eden. So if he's still Lucifer, okay, I want you to think back what I was talking about Atlantis. And when I was talking about, um, when I was talking about Genesis, between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, okay, there were cities built. We saw that in Jeremiah 4. Well, uh, who weakened the nations? Was the rebellion going on at that point? You know, I have reason to believe that the rebellion was going on even before Genesis 1 creation. It started. So, anyway. But that's conjecture. Okay. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now right here, when we say stars, we're not talking about twinkle, twinkle little stars. This is allegory. And we, like I said, we're going to get into allegory. Um, this is the um, angels of God. Okay? Angels of God. Those are the stars, the morning stars. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. If anybody ever wants to know what that means, um, Zen Garcia has a book that I believe has that title about the congregation in the sides of the north or something like that he's got. But if you go, if you look up Zen Garcia books online, you'll, you'll know that's enough information to know which book it is. Um, it is all about this, okay? All about what happened in the heavens, okay? I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly Look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake the kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? You know, that's interesting. I just noticed that. We're going to have to come back to that later um, as I get into what I'm talking about. Okay, so anyway, I'm um, going to finish reading this. All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden underfoot okay he doesn't have a very good outlook does he he wanted to be God he wanted to be God he was after God's throne you know this wasn't just an angel that um, got upset and then started wreaking some havoc up in the heavenlies as he did 
this one decided he was gonna he was gonna go and put himself over the living God okay he was gonna take that throne so anyway with that I'm not gonna I'm gonna oh you know what I'm already almost into this video okay I wanted to take the time so we could see who Lucifer was because he was a very important angel he had a lot higher ranks than a lot of the other angels you know the Lord has um, all these different layers of angels they all have different functions it's its own hierarchy well Lucifer was in there he was up in the top I mean he was the covering cherub he had an important position he had an anointing these things went to his head his beauty was he was narcissistic he 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 was overcome by himself and um, he decided that he was going to go up against the Lord God and take that throne and when we come back I'm going to finish up with what did happen in the heavenlies be blessed